Okay, 1 John 2, verses 10 through 12. So John has just been writing about this commandment, which is really not new because it's an old one, because they've always heard it before, but it's new as well in Jesus and in the community. And he's already alluded to what the commandment is because he said you can't say that you're in the light and hate your brother. That would be a contradiction. You're still in the darkness. So the commandment, of course, is not to hate, but rather to love. And we're going to eventually get to that. So, who is this person? Ha agapon. Again, substantival use of the participle. This is the, the one who is loving, the one who loves. Ha agapon. The one loving, direct object, the brother of him. The one loving his brother. Mene, common word in Gospel of John, also in 1 John, remains. The one loving his brother remains in tofoti, in the light. So the last screen and this one, they're talking about both light and darkness. Uh, you claim to be in the light, but you hate. Then you're actually not in the light. You're actually in the darkness, which is passing away. But if you love your brother, then you actually are in the light. And scandalon in him not is. So that's an expression for, and there isn't any scandalon in him. A scandalon is not in him. So we get the English word scandal, actually, from that. It's something which trips us up, something which is, uh, um, well, it, it prevents us from reaching the goal. If you think of tripping, uh, the word is used in the New Testament for a stumbling block, uh, something that you trip over. So if we love and we're in the light, we're not going to trip and fall. Uh, probably the imagery here is you're more likely to trip over something if you're in the dark than if you're in the light. Uh, on the other hand, it's really saying there isn't anything to trip over. Uh, you're, you're, you're living correctly. So now it's going to go back and forth. The one who hates, this is the one who loves. But by contrast, the one who hates, the hating person, substantive use of the participle, the one who hates his brother is enteiskotia, we've already seen that in the last screen, is in the darkness, and he not only is in the darkness, but he does this in the darkness. He walks in the darkness. So again, the idea of you're going to be, you can, something's going to trip you up if you're walking and you can't see properly. Uh, and so this person is in the darkness, he's walking in the darkness, and there is a scandal on that's going to trip him up. So he is in the darkness, and he walks in the darkness, and he doesn't know where he is going. So this is Oida, this is this, it's a present tense, but it's an irregular verb. Oida, first person singular. Oiden, third person singular. So he doesn't know who, where he is going. So here's a, I mean, we, we would translate it correctly if we just did that, but if you look really closely, you discover that there's actually something unusual about that. So this is the word where, and this is the word. Where as a question word. This happens actually quite often. This is someone and this is who. So you turn it into a question. So with the, with the accent, it's the question word. Now you look at this, you say, but it's not a question. He walks in the darkness and he doesn't know where he is going. Shouldn't it be the normal one that's not a question? Actually in Greek, whenever you have what we think of as kind of an indirect speech, uh, the authors or the speakers will use inside the indirect speech as much of the grammar as they possibly can that belongs to the direct speech. In other words, the thing that you don't know is what? It's where he is going. Well, what if you wanted to know? What would you do? Well, you'd ask a question. Where is he going? That'd be a question word. So now it's been, that's the implied question. He doesn't know the answer to the question, where is he going? So now we're going to make an indirect speech. He doesn't know 
where he is going. In English, it stops being a question. In Greek, it technically stops being a question, but that doesn't mean you erase the marks of the question, because the question would have been implied uh, if it hadn't been indirect speech. So that might sound complex. We're going to find a couple more examples uh, later on in 1 John where elements of direct speech are preserved in a, in a context where the text has actually been shifted into indirect speech. Very minor point. If you had just translated and not he knows where he is going, it would have been completely correct. It's just we wouldn't truly have taken into account why that accent is there. So why? Why doesn't he know where he's going? Because the darkness did this to his eyes. End of the sentence. To ophthalmos of two. So what did they do? What does darkness do to eyes? Well, doesn't really change your eyes. Your eyes are still doing what they're supposed to do. They just don't, it doesn't work because the darkness is making everything else invisible to you because there's not no light shining on it. But they think of that as blinding eyes. So you walk into a dark place, suddenly your eyes are blind. They're not really blind. It's, there's a different problem going on. Physiologically, at least, the problem's a different one. It's not like your eyes don't function anymore. It's like they can't do their job because there's something out there that isn't doing its job properly. Uh, but that's viewed as a form of causing blindness. I suppose you could say if you put a blindfold over your face, then you've now blinded the person. You haven't actually changed the ability of their eyes to, to function as organs. You've just prevented them from doing their work. Uh, so that's the word to blind. Uh, the adjective, when Jesus heals the blind, that's always an adjective, the blind person. So, oops, that would be the blind one, using an adjective, and that's then the verb that goes with it. Okay, new paragraph. That's the explanation for this letter, which is not easily recognized, is it? That's a capital gamma. Uh, in Greek, capital letters are used rarely. They're usually used for names. They're sometimes used for the first letter of a direct quotation and they ought to be used at the beginning of a new paragraph. And so the editors decided that they would call this a new paragraph. I just didn't format it that way on the PowerPoint. But that's the explanation for the capital letter. I am writing to you technia. Before he called them agapetoi, beloved. Now he calls them children. Again, it looks like a nominative, neuter plural. It's actually a vocative neuter plural because the author is directly addressing. I am writing to you children because so this word is the one I call the hard to recognize V verb. So all these endings don't really tell you what the stem is but if we recognize this from our vocabulary memorization then it's actually from this. Afiemi to forgive, uh, this is the apa prefix to the word, but it ends up being the only part we recognize. All this stuff kind of gets swallowed up in, in the vowels in the middle. So this is actually a perfect passive. Uh, it's hard to figure out exactly where the reduplication is. It's somewhere in there. Uh, because the, the stem is really that, and then the stem goes away. and Basically, we just have to say it's a perfect passive. Uh, we can't figure out exactly how they produced it, but we can verify it with principal parts. Just go to Afiemi, go to perfect middle passive, and you should find this form, except this is third person plural. Uh, so it would probably be something like Afiemi. Something like that. Uh, so, perfect of forgive, passive, so has been forgiven, or the sins have been forgiven, uh, and therefore you are now in a forgiven state. So, remember to focus on the present condition. Okay. I am writing to you, children, because the sins have 
been forgiven for you, what would be one way of interpreting this, Dave? Uh, you could say your sins and consider the date of a form of possessive, which does sometimes happen, but that's probably less likely. So this is then the subject of the passive verb. The sins have been forgiven for you. Dia with the accusative would be on account of, not through, on account of ta onoma outu, on account of his name. Okay, let me just read that last sentence one more time. I am writing to you, children, because the sins have been forgiven for you, and you are now forgiven on account of the name of him, on account of Jesus' name.